Hmm. What to play? What to play? I need something brand new. Something that will actually get me involved more into gaming. Hmm. Doom attack. Perfect! Alright, let's get right to it then. Let's make another video! Greetings and salutations my wonderful people, it's Bloody Jack from the Bloody Jack channel. If you like and subscribe this, in this video before this intro is over, I'll be your best mate. So, yes, this is the next part of probably what is the most declining web series. Part 4 of the top 100 video games of all time, in my opinion. So, yes, we're going to go from 41 to 50 in this video. So, without wasting any time whatsoever, like I normally do, we're just going to get right into it. So, first off, Portal 2, which came out in 2011, released by Valve, and it came out on the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. Takes place, God knows how many years after the first portal which originally came out in 2007 with the orange box um, once again you play a shell from portal 1 who I want to say was given more of a personality but unless you've read the some of the lore mostly through comic books like the portal I think it's portal still alive which does give you a brief little bit of background on what happened before Portal 2. But yeah, Shell is teamed up with Wheatley, played by that one guy from the Ricky Gervais show, everyone knows his name. Every, well, every British person might know his name, but for the Americans out there, they might know him as the guy with the glasses in The Two Fairy. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but what happens is GLaDOS wakes up again, but then something happens to another Wheatley gets into control of the facility but Wheatley takes over like takes over the whole lot of Aperture Science so you have to go all the way from the old labs back when Aperture Science was run by Cave Johnson in the old labs underground work your way back up to the top and to defeat Wheatley I'd say it's a, it was a perfect sequel you could easily beat that game in a day I mean, Portal games, once you've beat them once, you can easily do a speed run on them. Uh, the fascinating thing about this is the developer's commentary that's actually in the extras, where you get like loads of behind the scenes facts and stuff on the development of the game. Uh, the co-op mode, where you play as the new characters that were based on the trailers, Wheatley and Atlas, not Wheatley and Atlas, um, Atlas and Peabody. Very fun fact, Atlas is obviously a reference to the character from the Greek mythology, Atlas the man who lifts the world, and Peabody as in Peabody and Sherman. Awesome little fact there for you guys. 
Um, okay storytelling with zero cutscenes, really, added to the game. Uh, only dialogue from the robotic characters and Cave Johnson, played by the same guy that plays James Jonah Jameson in the Spider-Man trilogy. All out, fantastic game. What more can I say? Uh, moving on. Skate 3, which came out in 2010, uh, made developed by EA, or Electronic Arts, if you want to be a dick about it. It's the third entry in the Skate series, and it's also kind of a spin-off to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series. Not really any story to it, the game's a glitchy, broken mess, but I just love it for what it is. Um, I don't skate person. I don't use skateboards personally. I do like skateboards. I did watch. I did look up to Tony Hawk. I loved watching skateboarding videos growing up, but I never had the ability to skate myself. Um, yeah, Skate Three is my favorite out of the trilogy. Um, you can make your own skateboarding character, just like in the previous Skate games. But what compares this to Skate One and Two is you, there's more free roaming in Skate 3 than Skate 1 and 2, where, as in you can actually get off your skateboard and wander about acting like a spastic. Um, the only, there is like one actor I do know that's voice acting in the game, and it's Jason Lee, the guy who plays Earl in My Name is Earl, or Dave from Alvin and the Chipmunks who plays Coach Frank, and he actually does an absolutely brilliant job in the tutorial like guiding you through everything. I find him kind of hilarious, as he always is. But yeah, if you want to check out Skate 3, definitely check it out. This You can still get it on Steam. It came out on Xbox 360, PS3, and PC, and it's backwards compatible if you have an Xbox One or a PS4, so I would highly recommend you guys check that game out. Next, we have Bayonetta, which came out in 2009, and it was developed by Capcom, I believe, and it came out on the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC, but then it got a remaster slash re-release on the Wii U and Nintendo Switch. Uh, it's a sp I want to say it has the same ideas from the original Devil May Cry games. But you play as Bayonetta, who is a half-breed of a priest, of a, I want to say a white priest or a white mage, and a Umbra witch, which basically is what she is. Uh, it's got very, very, if you are a fan, I'm not going to explain anything on the story, but the best way I can sum this game up is if you like action plat like third-person action platformers, or if you just like playing Devil May Cry-esque games, I highly recommend you guys play Bayonetta. Mostly if you're a fan of just the Devil May Cry games. And I would also recommend you guys check out Bayonetta Bloody Fate the movie, which is a really good anime adaptation of the character. But yeah, that's all I'm going to say. Moving ahead. Ninja Gaiden 2, the more specifically the remake which came out in 2008 on the PS3 and Xbox 360 uh, made by I also believe Capcom and Ninja I think Ninja Theory were involved in this but you play as um, Ryu Hayabusa or Ryu Hayabusa depending on your pronunciation of the character's name uh, basically the ninja guy from Dead or Alive <laughs> to be more specific but yeah you play as Ryu Hayabusa and the whole plot of the game is basically Ryu has to stop the uh, the black spider clan from reactivating a an ancient artifact called the Archfiend basically they just want to release monsters and demons on our world the game's really gory and it's pretty difficult depending on your gameplay style. I have definitely had loads and loads of trouble with this and it is one of the first few Xbox games I actually got when I first had the 360. 
uh, it's backwards compatible, you can still get it, and you can probably still get it on Steam for a pretty fair price. Um, it's also one of the few games that goes over the top with its anime kind of style. But I don't want to waste too much time talking about just Ninja Gaiden. We have loads of other games to talk about through this list. But yeah, I would highly recommend you guys check out Ninja Gaiden 2 if you've already played Ninja Gaiden 1 or 3 or if you've played the original NES versions of the games. Next, we have Duke Nukem Forever which came out in 2011 on the 360, PS3 and the PC. Now I know I'm going to get loads of comments on this very controversial opinion. I like Duke Nukem Forever because it's not taken seriously. Yes, the controls are a bit shit. Yes, the um, loading screens take bloody forever to actually work. But I think it's alright. It wants to be a comedy game. It doesn't want to take itself too seriously. And that's what I think it achieves. It achieves to be a somewhat hilarious game. Yeah, it's very lowbrow humour, but that's the kind of stuff I kind of find funny. And if I'm having a, like a low point in my day, I just think of something funny from Duke Nukem. I've played the other Duke Nukem games in the series, Duke Nukem 3D, The Manhattan Project, Land of the Babes. But yeah, Duke Nukem Forever was a game in development hell, and it does take the piss out of that fact. But you play as Duke Nukem, who it was somewhat retired after 12, I think it's... 12 years, like 12, 11 years in the game, because it takes place after Duke Nukem 3D, and you also replay the ending from Duke Nukem 3D, which is, it's an alright tutorial level, but the main point of the game, despite the plot being kind of bland, I mean, with the same, it's the same aliens, basically, from Duke Nukem 3D, they've come back to Earth to take their revenge on Duke, and they do this by kidnapping all the women on Earth and using the- it's like aliens. Like, the level when you actually find them is very much like aliens, where you find people strapped to the walls and stuff. It's horrendous. But I would recommend you guys play Duke Nukem Forever, just to give it a little taste, but don't take it too seriously. Next, we have Prototype, which came out in 2009 on the 360, um, PS3 and PC, and got a remaster on the Xbox One PS4 and PC as well, and on the Switch. Prototype 1, you basically play as some dude who I can't even remember the name of, but he's basically infected with this virus, which gives him awesome powers, like turning his arm into a shield, turning his fingers into gigantic thing like finger knives, um, like hammers to slam shit into, uh, you can also grab people by the neck, you can sprint up buildings, you can uh, yeet them at loads of other places and you can like consume their bodies and shapeshift into them, gaining their memories. The whole point of the game is basically you're just trying to spread the virus throughout the city and try and take over everything that's in front of you. And with that I'm not even going to say anything. <laughs> Moving forwards, Hell Yeah, Wrath of the Dead Rabbit, which came out in 2012 on the Xbox Arcade, the PlayStation Store, and on the PC in 2012. An awesome, awesome side-scrolling platformer where you play as Ash, who is the Prince of Hell. Upon his father's retirement or death, um, Ash will become the the king of hell, basically. And one day he was having a little private time to himself, basically fucking a duck. And someone, well, some paparazzi scumbags took some very sneaky photos of him, which then got a hundred views, and then it obviously annoys the hell out of Ash. So he goes out of his own way to go back into hell and to kill the 100 demons that saw these photos and maybe videos as well. 
it's very gory for what it is. Uh, it's got the same thing as like Stubbs the Zombie or um, Naughty Bear has, or like Conker's Bad Fur Day. It looks like a somewhat kid-friendly game, but it really just isn't. The I mean, basically, your whole weapon, you only have two weapons in the game. Your jetpack, which is actually, if you have the basic skin for it, it's just a gigantic spinning saw blade. And your other weapon is a various um, number of guns. Like rocket launchers, assault rifles, shotguns, grenade launchers. And you've got like all the glory kills, which are just insane to actually charge up. But I would highly recommend you guys check that game out if you ever get the chance. Uh, next, Blue Dragon, which came out in 2007 on the Xbox 360, PS3, and PC. Uh, it was created by the same guy that made, well, that designed Dragon Ball, Akira Toriyama. Uh, it's an open world RPG game. It's got very similar, like, Dragon Quest elements to it, but you play as three main characters, but the only one I can remember is the one character which is obviously designed based on, well whose design is heavily based on a combination of Goku and Gohan from Dragon Ball, whose name is Shu. Uh, basically him and a couple of his friends tried to defeat this weird overlord old, like it's basically they try to kick the shit out of this old man that's been terrorizing the people. Like the humans for years by using the violet clouds, and he basically finds pleasure in just basically causing fear and killing other loads of other people. But um, Shu and his friends get these abilities where whatever they're feeling, it manifests into a giant shadow. You have a saber-toothed tiger, a dragon, a minotaur, and a phoenix and basically they can show off their abilities by what emotions they're feeling. It's a very complex, it's a very long game, because if you even had a physical, if you had a physical copy of the game, it spans over three discs. So have fun with that. If you like open world RPG story-based games, just check it out. I, I really wouldn't say it any better myself. Next. Final Fantasy VII, which came out originally, came out in 1997, because I'll be talking about the, the mainly the PS1 version, not the remake that's just come out, because I have not played the remake yet. But for the sake of simplicity, I will just have footage of the original game, mostly in like cutscenes and, so, and such. But yeah, everyone knows Final Fantasy VII, everyone knows it's a classic game, and it's like it was so much of a classic, it was even featured on the PlayStation Classic, which came out a couple of years ago. I There's no point in me explaining the story, everyone's heard of Final Fantasy VII, and anyone that owns a PS4 at the moment is probably playing um, <laughs> Final Fantasy VII right now. I mean... It's Final Fantasy, there's nothing really I can say that can top it. Just check the game out. And also, Cloud is my main in Smash, if anyone wants to know. Uh, finally, in this part of the episode, all of the Oddworld games. Created by the Oddworld, by the company Oddworld Inhabitants. Um, at the moment, there's five games in the Old World series. You've got Abe's Odyssey, which came out in 1997, um, Abe's Exodus, which came out in 1998, Munch's Odyssey, which came out in 2001, Stranger's Wrath, which came out in 2005, and New and Tasty, which is basically a remake of Abe's Odyssey in 2014. Uh, you've got the first game, Abe's Odyssey, which originally came out on the PS1, and also it has a import on Steam now, if you guys want to check this game out. I mean, Abe's Odyssey is basically just a side-scrolling platforming puzzle game, which is hard as balls. Basically you have to, well you play as Abe, who is a Madokan, working at, as a janitor at Rupture Farms, but he finds out that since prices have been running low, and some of the 
and the people that run the factory, the Gluckens, have basically been using wild animals like scrabs and like basically scrabs and paramites but they've been using them in their foods for so long that it, they've actually nearly been wiped out to near extinction so instead they would decide to use Mendokins as their next product so Abe basically has your, your main objective in Abe's Odyssey is basically you've got to save all, you got to try and save all 99 Mudokans in Rupture Farms. I mean, you can possess enemies, you can use in-game speak to talk to your, the fellow Mudokans and such. The game's story is really good. I mean, I really can't really say much. I mean, yeah, the game does, like, graphic-wise, it does look a little dated. But they were really trying their hardest to push the limitations on the PS1's um, capabilities at the time. Then you got Abe's Exodus, which came out only a mere nine months later. Um, it takes place, assuming if you got the good ending in um, Abe's Odyssey. Basically, you, you saved all 99 Mudokans. But it turns out there's a new drink being made by the Gluckens called Soulstorm. Um, not Soulstorm, uh, Soulbrew. And the dark secret turns out to be that. Yeah, that. Um, it's made out of Madokan bones. <laughs> and what is more terrifying than that? And you got loads of other things that are going horribly wrong. In the series, you got to save an extra 299 Dockens through the whole game. Uh, they added more controls into the game speak, but they just gave they made the game a little bit more challenging. But they added the quick save feature in that installment on the franchise, which then became permanent throughout the rest of the series. Then later, Oddworld decided to go and move on to Microsoft, making Munch's Odyssey a Xbox exclusive, but it then got a release on PC years later, where you play as Munch, who is a um, a gabbit, and you also team up with Abe, and you got to try and save because you got to try and save not only Madokans occasionally, but you also got to help Gabbit try and rescue all of the gab. You got to try and help. Munch get all the Gabbit eggs before they're wiped before his race is wiped out entirely. Then you've got um, Stranger's Wrath, which is a cult classic of the Old World series. Despite the reviews upon its release were devastating because EA at the time handled the marketing poorly. Um, you play as the Stranger, no Abe, no Munch, none of that in the series. But you play as the stranger, and it's basically an open-world RPG-style game, which has third-person and first-person elements in the game. And you're basically just a bounty hunter who's just doing what he feels is right and what he's trying to do to survive. But then you've got New and Tasty, which I do have on Steam. It's an entirely good from the ground up remake of Abe's Odyssey, and it improved a lot of the gameplay style. It's still a side scroller by using 2.5D um, animations, which I think are actually really good. And if you really want to introduce a, a new generation into the Old World franchise, I'd recommend you start playing New and Tasty, and then go throughout the rest of the franchise. Or you can just get the Old World box set on Steam, which you can get real cheap, which is what I did to get myself back into the Old World franchise, because. As of 2018, it was announced that Oddworld Inhabitants are making a new game called Oddworld Soulstorm, which is to be released this year. So far, only a trailer and, well, a teaser trailer and gameplay footage has been released. And that, other than that, no other news has been announced. So, that was top 40, that was 41 to 50 on my top 100 video games of all time. Um, like, comment, subscribe on what you think on these games, personally. Um, 
yeah, like, comment, subscribe, share on your social media, follow me on my social medias, you can find me on Twitter, on Twitch, and on Facebook. I'll put a link in the description down below to all my social media pages so you guys can check that out. But yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one.